ways of theologizing about the mission work and the mission concept. The first of the speakers, Albano, born in India, did his basic studies in India first for the priesthood, was ordained in 2011, and then he volunteered to come to Australia. Uh, but we moved him over to New Zealand to have a New Zealand Kiwi experience first in pastoral work. And it was during that time that Albano asked for permission to do higher studies. All the way through his uh, preparation to become a Divine Word missionary, he has been interested in interfaith dialogue, but also the element of culture that comes in that whole mystery uh, concept of reaching out to other people. Albano went to Rome and in a very short time and very good qualifications, received a licentiate in missiology. And while he was there, he met a friend who did an extra year of study in London to work on a professional manner of teaching and of writing. Again, he finished that successfully. And when he came back to Australia, became a member of the staff of Yarra Theological Union and also the Univers University of Divinity. He has done a marvelous job and been a key member of the team of um, mission education and research. And so this is the first effort to open the discussion to lead into a larger picture of what is happening and maybe what is not yet happening, but at least to give it a direction. So Albano, uh, your topic is quite big. Who, what, where, and how of mission? Um, I would like to invite you then to go ahead and share with your research and your wonderful uh, ideas about this topic. Thank you, Nick, for that, <coughs> for that wonderful, elaborate uh, introduction. I feel privileged to be part of this uh, joint collaborative effort of uh, of MER, Mission Education and Research. Am I audible enough? I think you can just put it in the chat if you can't hear me. Uh, I see Bill smiling, so that's a good sign. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, a missionary renewal in the church, the who, why, what, where, and how of mission. I have divided my lecture into two parts. The first you can see who and why. Uh, that will consist of the first section and then what, where, and the how of mission, the different aspects of mission. It's an introductory uh, lecture today. So welcome everyone. I have seen people, uh, conference sisters, religious joining us from Chile and from different parts of the world. Uh, welcome, a warm welcome. So at this moment, I take this time to acknowledge the country where I were where I am based here in Melbourne on the Wurundjeri land. And I also request you to take a moment to acknowledge wherever you are based currently in your walk of life and acknowledge the traditional custodians of your land. We acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kuli Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which we stand and we pay our respects to elders past, present, and an emerging. We hope that the Mission Education and Research Lecture Webinar Series of 2023, it's a new venture that uh, uh, the three of us, the idea came together, three of us during the provincial chapter 
in March that we came together, myself, Dean, and Anthony, and we thought about how about starting a new venture of, of lecture series. So we continue to do this. And I think it's part of our ongoing formation. Uh, may constitute an intense experience of reflection and of communion for the various religious institutes favoring a renewed apostolic momentum in favor of the proclamation of the gospel in the vastness that God's mission is a docile and a courageous action in the work, first and foremost, of the Holy Spirit. So a warm welcome, everyone. And I would like to thank the organizers, especially uh, Father Tien Nguyen as the coordinator of MARE, Mission Education and Research, and for the invitation to deliver the inaugural lecture. And in a special way, I would like to thank Father Nick de Groot, who was the former vice provincial of the Australia SVD province, and also a missiologist and a researcher uh, up in PNG for many years. I wish to begin this inaugural lecture with a keynote, uh, uh, with a quote from St. John Paul II as he addressed to the bishops of Oceania, all renewal in the church must have mission as its goal. If it is not to fall, to, not to fall prey of a kind of ecclesial introversion, and so we pray, pray to the spirit which is within us. Lift us up, abiding spirit, above all obstacles and grant us a glimpse of what is possible. Help our hearts and our minds to discover that you are in our fears, that you are in our hopes and in our commitments. And as rightly Stephen Bevins quoting Rowan Williams would say, mission is finding out where the spirit is at work and joining in. And so we turn to the spirit. Let's take a moment to read this beautiful hymn that we sing so often in the church, Veni Sancte Spiritus. And so I have divided my whole presentation today, firstly with the introduction, the source of the title. Section one, I will deal with the roots of mission, the who and the what of mission. And then I will begin with the emerging of a transforming vision that is emerging, that is coming out of the Second Vatican Council. And in part two, section I will deal with the various aspects of mission, the why, the when, the where, and the how of mission. And I have taken the theme of hearts on fire, feet on the move, which is the theme of the next Mission Sunday uh, by Pope Francis for this year in October. There is a long-standing church practice for us to use different milestones stones as an opportunity to look back, to build on insights from the past, and there is obvious a great merit in that. But the practice stresses continuity. As we shall see, there is some continuity, but also significant discontinuity between the first mission document that was released in 1919, Maximum Ilud, and the corpus of the magisterial teaching generated on mission theology and practiced over the subsequent centuries, particularly from the Second Vatican Council onwards. And so 
This paper that I'm presenting this evening is part of a much larger project. A few weeks ago, the Australasian Catholic Record approached me to write a much larger paper, a project to be part of that, of the anniversary edition of the 100 years of what are the changes that have taken, that have taken place in the discipline of missiology. Of course, missiology, I love, I'm so passionate about mission because it's an interdisciplinary subject. And you can, you can bring in various trends when you reflect upon mission. And so the source of the title is the title of this presentation come from Pope Francis Apostolic Exhortation from 2013, Evangelii Gaudium num number 27 a document which is his summary of and response to the Synod on the New Evangelization in 2012. It is a phrase to which Pope Francis returned when he wrote four years later to Cardinal Fernando Filoni, Prefect of the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples, strongly agreeing to the congregation's respect, request for an extraordinary mission month devoted to Mission Argentis to be celebrated in, 20, in October 2019 with the theme Baptized and Sent. And so Mission Argentis is understood in the life of the church as the mission to, today we may say Mission Intergentis. Mission Argentis means going to the people. Whereas in today's term, we can call it Mission Missio Intergentis, Missio or Mission among the people wherever you are. So those who have not had the opportunity to, to hear of Jesus and his saving message of love, an invitation to relationship. It is an aspect of mission which some have ceased to become serious about, a fact that recent popes have challenged and written to a more than once, for example, Pope John Paul II, in his great encyclical devoted to the mission Argentis, Redemptoris Missio in 1990, and Pope Francis in his letter referred to the above. And so a phrase, the phrase, a missionary renewal, all renewal in the church is having mission as its goal. Captures my understanding of the potential of the missionary impulse running within the faith community, an impulse to put the gospel to work in the world in the transforming way. The truths, the phrase points to have shaped my life and doubtless those most of you present in this webinar. And so in the passage quoted by Pope Francis is concentrating specifically on what a missionary renew renewal can do for the church itself. However, if you follow through the teachings of Francis and other recent popes, especially Pope Paul VI and John Paul II, each of whom has contributed to much to providing depth to mission theology and practice. And it will take little convincing that such a missionary impulse has the potential of transforming not only the church, but indeed the society and culture. And so in his letter to Cardinal Filoni, which is itself worthy of study, Pope Francis reiterated that the mission Argentis remains an essential task and he points to the fact that the missionary church, nature of the church draws everyone into the work. And far from the age of mission being over, Pope Francis's mission is only beginning and that we must commit ourselves wholeheartedly to its service. And he speaks of the urgent need to awaken the ordinary and the pastoral mission in the face of tiredness and formalism. The last point and the wording of it is of so vitally important. Let me say from the outset, however, that the artificial divide between the missional and the pastoral work of the church, which has characterized church's life in so many ways in recent centuries, has proved very detrimental to church's life and mission effectiveness. And in the light of the renewed theology, mission theology of recent decades, these two elements must be seen to be in a dynamic, interconnected relationship.
Moving on to the first section, the emerging of a transforming vision. Now I'm not going back to 100 years, starting from, from 1919, from Maximum Ilud. What are the changes that have happened in the discipline of missiology? But rather, I will focus my attention from Mission Ad Gentis, the roots. So during the council, the theological basis of the Ad Gentis mission was discussed and ultimately found expression in the document of the same name, Ad Gentis, as I explained to you all already, going out to the people. And at this stage, it is appropriate to acknowledge the work of the SVD Superior, then SVD Superior General, Father Johannes Schutte, SVD, who was brought in as a chair and rescued, so to say, the whole mission discussion from being becoming hopelessly bogged down in partial understanding and competing interests and priorities. Under his, under his chairmanship, the limited and unacceptable mission theology, theology which was previously proposed and rejected was replaced by a profound alternative. And his leadership took the mission discussion of the council on to the next level. Just as today, Pope Francis refuses to become sidetracked by the conservative progressive dualism, which so bedevils the church's life, opting instead for a radical position and that of missionary discipleship, so too did Father Schutte take mission, took mission understanding beyond entrenched positions, opting for a radical breakthrough, the missionary nature of the entire church and of all its members. In their encyclopedic work on mission, Stephen Bevins and Roger Schroeder rightly speak of the Argentus document as a dense theological meditation on the nature of mission. And because of the reminder in Argentus that rather than being first and foremost a work of the church, and hence in the control of the church, mission takes its origin in the life of the Blessed Trinity. And we are unable to see mission as a sharing of God's life and work. And we are so fortunate and privileged to have Roger Schroeder with us today. And Stephen Bevins is also going to join us in this, in this joint venture of mission education and research in the days to come. And I would like to extend a warm welcome to Roger to Australia. He had just arrived this morning from the Philippines. Thank you, Roger, for joining us. Let's spend a few moments reflecting on this beautiful definition from the Second Vatican Council, Argentus, number two. The pilgrim church is missionary by her very nature. I love this. I love this image of being a pilgrim church that we haven't arrived and we are continuously walking together, walking alongside with each other, keeping, making the Holy Spirit as the primary importance and guide in all that we say and do. And so since it is from the mission of the Son and of the mission of the Holy the Spirit that she draws her origin in accordance with the decree of God the Father. This decree, however, flows from the fount like love or charity of God the Father, who has generously poured out and does not cease to pour out still his divine goodness. Today we use the phrase God's mission, miss your day, quite readily bearing in mind the gift of God's life in baptism. And that is with the share of God's life comes a share in responsibility for God's mission, God's work in the world today. Argentus speaks, as you can see up on the screen, we have altogether 16 documents that were produced that came out of the Second Vatican Council. Four decrees, four constitutions, nine decrees, and we have three declarations. Argentus speaks of God's mission in terms of mission of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Just as God has reached out beyond God's self, sending the Son and the Holy Spirit into the human history, 
in the particularities of times and places, so must the church be with people in every time and place, helping them to hear and to respond to God's call to relationship and to engage in healing, teaching, and reconciling as Jesus did. Rather than a community focused on itself, on its own integrity, the church is described in our genthus as essentially dynamic, open, discovering, integrating in historical action. Again, Stephen Bevins and Roger Schroeder's claim that it is the fine expression of the contemporary challenge of the church in every place, the integrating capacity of mission in the church's life and activity. And so in the introduction, I noted that Pope Francis raises questions and challenges about the church's capacity to be in a constant state of mission. And with the transforming theology of Vatican II, the focus shifts to God and to God's dynamic life as the origin and the ultimate goal of mission. Here indeed is the vision to inspire the baptized and to transform tired old arguments, arrangements, thought patterns, and unimaginative ways of being and doing. It's only if it is only given a chance. And so in our genthus, the council fathers drew the attention of the whole church to the fact that since mission is first and foremost God's work, church communities and individuals are privileged participants in that God, in what God is affecting in the world and need to discern where this is occurring. And so given that the Father has sent the Son and the Holy Spirit into the world, instead of being lost in self-absorption, we must ask where the Holy Spirit is clearly moving the people of the world towards the good and how the communities of faithful can foster this movement. And so the recognition of God at work in the world provides the basis for the church's dialogue with the world and expands the scope of mission enormous, enormously. As well as the document Argentus, other documents of Vatican II need to be considered if we are to build an adequate basis for mission renewal today. I am unable to do every one of them in, with this, within this short period of time, but I will just touch, try to touch upon Lumen Gentium, Gaudium Espes, and Nostra Aetate. The two great documents dealing with the church, Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church, which deals with its nature and identity, and Gaudium Espes, the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world, which deals specifically with its relationship with the world, are each in different ways profoundly missional in character. The Gaudium Espes is in its entirely a missional document is clear from its subject matter, relationship with the world, and solidarity with its people in both joys and in, the, and in their sorrows. Its theological methodology, a discernment of the signs of the times, continue to underpin mission theology and practice today. The current emphasis on the need for communities to engage in theological reflection for effective missionary engagement flows from this requirement for disciples to be first and foremost, people of discernment. Gaudium Espes also addresses the theme of a relationship between faith and culture, which remains the key challenge in our mission today. The integration of life, faith, and culture is central to Christian education at every level. The faith, life, culture relationship is one of, the, one of interdependence, mutual challenge, and enrichment. As a biblical people who understand that God encounters us in the circumstances of our lives, our very way of life and culture assumes a vital place. And as noted above, it is in the institutions of the broader society and culture that Christians are called today to do their vital mission work. And so by utilizing in its descriptions of the church's graphic kingdom of God images from the synoptic gospel, seed, Little flock, salt and light, Lumen Gentium number five, teaches that the church is at the service of the kingdom of God. And we note that these are the process images. Seeds germinate and grow. Little flock survives and increases. Salt 
adds flavor, light that shows the way. And so the church is called to function in these ways in its service to the kingdom of God. These images are not those of grandeur transformative force, but rather of positive movement toward forward in genuine service, one which occurs quietly, but very effectively. And so the kingdom of God is present as much is in the process of striving as in the achievement of an accomplished goal. Let me move on to the importance of this beautiful document that came out in Nostra Etate. Nostra Etate, in our time. The other most important council document, one with a long-term missional impact and implications possibly beyond our imag imagining at this time is Nostra Etate. Declaration on the Church's relationship of the Church to non-Christian religions. In this, the bishops provided a perspective on a broader understanding of salvation than was generally held. And this perspective recognized that God has been at work in the world since the beginning of time among all peoples and cultures. And in this, the shortest of the Council documents, the Church is called upon to collaborate to collaborate with members of other religions, to preserve, to promote, to encourage, and to elevate the moral truths which are found in other faiths. And so mission thinking and practice is greatly transformed when this collaboration is taken as a vital goal. Given that the Holy Spirit is at work across the world and amongst all peoples of goodwill, the question is how can the church community enhance its commitments to interfaith collaboration and dialogue and to supporting unselfishly the good which many of these faiths communities are effecting in the world today. And whilst there is an implicit acknowledgement in this document, the faithful adherence of other religions attain salvation through their religious traditions. But at the same time, there is also a reaffirmation of the duty that Christians have to witness to their own faith, to what God has affected in a unique way in Jesus Christ. So two, two truths of faith are finally balanced together. God's universal and effective will that all be saved and the unique role of Jesus Christ as the universal savior. There are profound truths and the fullness of what they can mean in far and exhausted by current understandings. Humble theological exploration must continue into the future. Those who are called to do this work should be the subject of our prayerful support. Let me move on to the second section of Hearts on Fire, Feet on the Move, Mission Priorities in Australia in regard to public mission and parish life. The first challenge that we encounter when we talk about um, where, what, and how of doing mission is the dealing with fragmentation. Modernity persists albeit with the postmodern overlay and continues to shape our culture, which is characterized by individualism and the increasing differentiation of knowledge in all areas of life. A successful search for meaning via credible hermeneutical keys has never been more necessary. And so the earlier separation of mission into an enterprise for specialists separated from the mainstream church life a situation which characterized the pre-Vatican II approach to mission 
was a kind of ecclesial parallel to the secular separation of faith and culture, which is the dominant characteristic of modernity, at least in the sense that both were tendencies to separate the inseparable. And so the mission of Jesus when recognized as the centerpiece of our faith life helps Christians to integrate aspects of the faith's community's worldview and provides a basis for establishing priorities and making structural changes. With clarity in regard to the fundamentals, such integration enables each faith community to play its part in providing meaning in people's life as they struggle with the real possibility of drowning in the muddle of fragmentation. Today, across the globe, especially in Western countries, people are growing up with little knowledge of Jesus Christ and his gospel. And so we might say that the call to mission agendas is indeed central to mission here as much as anywhere else. Many teachers in schools and tertiary institutions attest to their own experience in regard to the fragmented and very limited knowledge of students, parents, and even young teachers. So to do priest when people come towards for sacraments, quality preaching, creative teaching, and effective formation have never been more clearly called for. Recently, I was at the formative session, which was run by Peter, uh, the Archbishop of Melbourne, Peter Comensolo. And he said in that, uh, in that presentation with the, with, the diocese and, with the diocese and fellow brothers, brother priest, he said, when it comes to real estate, it's all about location, location, location. But when it comes to, for us today in doing mission, he said our focus should be formation, formation, and formation. So what complicates the scene today is that many have been introduced to unconnected fragments of the Christian story, because ours was a Christian culture once. These fragments persist and people are enculturated into them in a haphazard and unconnected way. Wise ministers of the gospel find ways of working with and building on this in an integrating way. Gerald Arbuckle, a well-known social anthropologist here in Australia, often refers to his experience of working with people in Catholic healthcare setting and using the parable of the Good Samaritan to being the process of building out from a little fragmented knowledge into a fuller integrated knowledge base. Teachers in many sectors of the church's life resonate with this as a way forward and try to do the same. Second challenge, discerning the signs of the times in a post-secular age. There would have been a time not so long ago when we would most likely to have been discussing mission agentes framed by the assumptions that we are Christians living in a secular age, the contours of which were laid down in modernity. We would be grateful that Vatican II worked to develop an appropriate relationship with modernity, one of both collaboration and challenge. Now we recognize profound changes in secularity. Scholars speak of ours as a post-secular age. The term post-secular can be somewhat confusing, but it does not mean that aspects of the secular, example, the, se the separation of the church and the state, or the differentiation of knowledge no longer exist, just as post-modernity is modernity, with an overlay of new and far-reaching assumptions. So to post-secularism is secularity with the addition of new realities. One of the key assumptions of modernity has, however, proven to be entirely wrong because the disappearance of religion and the spiritual and the spiritual under the impact of human reason. It, has, it hasn't gone away. Secularization is in fact, is a fact of life and it is not going away anytime soon. Neither, it appears, is religion and an interest in the spiritual, even if there is very changed scenario 
occurring in Western countries in regard to church membership and attendance. So post-secular interpretive autonomy, a scholar whose work I have found very helpful in attempting to make an analysis of the current situation is Michelle Dillon. Michelle Dillon is a professor of sociology and the author of the 2018 volume, Post-Secular Catholicism. Dillon reminds us not only of the fact of which anyone schooled in Anthropology 101 is aware that unless the circumstances are exceptional, people take their culture as their first source of meaning making. And she draws out the consequences of that. People who continue to show how to be religious, albeit in a range of different ways, and many do even in Australia, do so with that Dylan describes as a stance of post-secular interpretive autonomy. They take lived experience and the wisdom of the secular culture as the first sources in their processes of meaning making. Church teaching is not unimportant to them, but it is not the most important nor the first thing they access in making sense of the experience of living in the contemporary context. Dylan points to the fact that the independence of the secular is recognized by church teaching itself, that ongoing allegiance to the church occurs even though people take their own autonomy as the major element in interpreting their experience and aspects in their context. And that they are increasingly at home with living in situations which are contrary to the ideals of church teaching. Indeed, it is because of these three factors that they maintain allegiance to the church. For those who remain in the church, there is an ongoing dialogue between their own interpretive autonomy and the ideals of the magisterium. And this is itself one of the signs of the times. It is therefore, the responsibility of those of us serious about mission to understand what is going on and to find ways, places and opportunities to facilitate this dialogue. And so public faith requires last final two points with that I will stop. Uh, public faith requires a collaborative, interpretive community. As we have noted, Catholicism is a faith with a public dimension. Neither do we live in the ghettos, but as noted earlier, Pope's religious and secular roles intersect and commingle. And this has been clear from the time of Leo XIII, who in 1891, stopped out of space in the public square for ethical commentary on the changing face of modernity, particularly of industrialization, and its impact and called on people of goodwill to work together, to work together for the common good. Popes have continued that role of the present. Many of us now recognize that the role of Catholic in today's world is being on mission in the public square. Are one and the same, even though mission in the public square takes many different forms. However, it is very, obvious that the public aspect of our faith requires greater understanding and leadership within the church, especially at parish and diocesan levels, in the midst of society's complexity, the tendency to fall back into modernity's individualism is powerful indeed. Dylan points to Gaudium Espes number 43, which speaks of the vital synthesis linking the religious identity of the individual with their everyday family life, work, social and civic activities through which they move things towards a better world and provide resistance to dehumanizing influence. In all of this, Dylan claims, the church can function not as a source of top-down authority from which action is directly deduced, but as a collaborative interpretive community in which scholars and practitioners, laity, priests, and religious collaborate honestly and with respect to their real experience. And this is the general point, but it applies with a particular post to mission, 
in the public square, such as joint social justice. Dylan speaks of conscience being formed by lived experience and thoughtful dialogue, just as surely or more surely than it is by the study of magisterial documents on various topics. I doubt that those who think, think things through would disagree. In the matter of mission, for example, missionary disciples are formed in interpreting, in dialoguing, and in involved families backed up ideally by parishes of the same kind. So key documents such as those I have cited today, when properly unpacked, nourish the community, which proceeds in the process of theological reflection, which is more inductive than deductive in nature. My final point, forming missionary communities. What concerns me most, however, is that in order to be interpretive communities, we first, all of us have to be communities. I see the building up of genuine communities within parishes as the greatest challenge we have in our internal church life and as a consequence in our missional life, because without the support of caring communities, individuals and families will easily drop away or simply give up. It is in the strength of small Christian groupings that the faith is nourished and maintained so that people are empowered for mission. Many of our parishes are dying because they are not by any stretch of the imagination, a communion of small caring communities. And to become such involves a pastoral conversion. Called by Pope Francis, it is the only way members will survive and cope with the pluralism and fragmentation in both church and society. We must come full circle, replicating in our time and place the situation of the communities of the post-apostolic times when people were drawn to learn more of Jesus Christ and his invitation to life, relationship, and mission because of their experience of the pastoral strength of the communities they encountered. And so, what's our mission today? As rightly said, and we will continue this discussion of living this prophetic dialogue Pastoral conversion goes hand in hand with missional conversion. During modernity, the time of Maximum Elude back in 1919, 100 years ago, the church aligned itself with modernity's tendency to differentiate life into separate, unrelated elements, organizing its life into separate, missional and pastoral streams, training personal accordingly. But today, the new, new mission theology works against this artificial split, seeking to reintegrate the vital elements of Catholic life. The pastoral conversion for Francis asks, for must occur in dioceses and in parishes up and down the land, accompanied by education and formation. It has the potential to reshape faith communities and to propel them beyond themselves in a transforming dynamic capable of generating life, solidarity and hope in Australia and far beyond. And so I would like to end this lecture in the words of the Evangelii Gaudium number 27. It embarks upon a missionary, a missionary renewal in all of God's faith. And let's be passionate, passionate in being part of that wonderful venture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Albano.
that was well presented, but it was very, very full and theological, yes. Theological, but it it was also the way that you presented it. There's a lot of hope. There's the energy that you are putting in it and the call for other people to participate. To respond, <clears throat> um, I won't be able to cover everything, but there's some things that stood out for me. All renewal in the church must have mission as its goal if it is not to fall prey to a kind of ecclesial introversion. How much of our history has really been, you know, to change the church or make the church holy? And it has not actually been concerned until Vatican II actually spoke up with Gaudium and Space that there was, and also uh, the first encyclical of social uh, endeavor to reach out to the world. Another concept that we can take a lot further is the dichotomy, if you like, continuity and discontinuity. People are trying to separate, you know, I am the one who continues and you are a new one and you are discontinuing. There is no split there. We need both. The church is not static, it is alive that has come out. The agenda's document, as you say, it was a short one, and yet it has within it a dynamism which is quite extraordinary that can convert the whole nature of the Catholic Church in the world. The other one that uh, Roger and Steve and you and others have also been pushing for it, that a church's mission draws everyone into mission. It is no longer a specialized field for a few strange people like us, you know, to go overseas or to do special things. But mission is the vocation of every Christian and beyond. And also very strongly that needs to be developed further no divide between missional and pastoral work in the church. Mm. That needs to get to all the ministers of the church, whether they are priests or deacons or, or lay people, to put pastoral work and mission together as one. Um, the transforming vision that you mentioned. Mission is not foremost a work of the church and hence in control of the church. There has been an arrogance in the Catholic Church that we had the truth and we had the power and it was only like documents with agentes and the tremendous life uh, examples of Pope Francis and John Paul and Benedict to reach out beyond the Catholic Church to communicate and share and to listen to fellow brothers in religion, that was very, very significant, I think. <clears throat> the other thing, the recognition of God's work in the world by many good things happening, this means more and constant dialogue the dialogue with the world. <clears throat> In the past, it seemed to be such a, a, a condemn, condemnation, even a misuse of the Bible. The world was evil and we were holy church. That has really been put upside down and to say, we can learn from the church and a greater ear listening and a greater humility would go bring us a long way into a much better uh, process 
of being mission uh, and serving as mission in the church in the world. Another big word that is very important is common discernment. At the moment, the church has basically uh, relied on the discernment of the bishops and cardinals and the pope and the priests sometimes. But the discernment of the majority of Christians has just had no place in our church. And the desire to participate in the common discernment uh, to discover the power of the spirit in that is a tremendous boost to the church and to the world. So again, that is a big area um, that you have talked about. Uh, another one, for quite a number of years, we thought that the Catholic Church was the kingdom of God. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and that has also been put on its head to say the kingdom of God is ever so much bigger, that we as a church are part of the kingdom, please God we are. But so are all the other people part of God's love. And to realize and to see that in a real way, in respecting them, into listening with them, and to working with them, uh, it brings us a long way into that whole direction. Uh, the other, one of the last points that you made that this whole missionary effort that is sharing in God's life of mission can only be done in community. There is the building of community that shares the gifts and also then expands the gifts, encourages. Uh, there's discernment, there is a listening, there is a whole dynamic that the community is a vital part of that dynamic. So any way, as you say, that could promote uh, group work, community work, community development would be just marvelous. Another word, of course, is dialogue. What does that really mean? People at first say, well, dialogue is talking to one another. But dialogue, first and foremost, is emptying oneself of judgment and preconceived ideas to be open to share a conversation or to, to be with another person. So to continue with dialogue with other people of faith or non-faith and with all aspects of the world too. And the dealing with the secular world, not as an evil, but also as a place where the Holy Spirit is active and supporting uh, wherever we can discover that. So, uh, Albano, you've covered an awful lot of territory. Uh, to challenge us, there are things that might lead us to go back to some of those documents and to look at them again to say, this has something to say to me and to you and to all of us. So thank you again very much, Alvano, for the wonderful paper that you presented. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that uh, very elaborative review of, the, of my paper. Uh, I, my whole focus uh, for this evening was to, to begin the discussion. Um, and to, it's like the throwing out some of the seeds, you know, for it to, to mature and to and to bear fruit in the days to come. And I think that's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives too. You know? um, I love that. Uh, thank you, Justin, for that uh, wonderful question. I have just picked up that from the chat. Thank you for your presence for this webinar here. Um, so what 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 is our mission post-COVID times? Um, well, we have... a. Uh, uh, I would say Father Steve Bevan will come in with more uh, directly addressing your question, like how to be creative discipleship in a post-COVID world. 
of the world, a new world that is emerging out of the pandemic. Uh, so of course, we will rely first and foremost, our main protagonist in directing us in the post COVID uh, world would be the Holy Spirit. And so discernment comes in. That's why I wanted to bring in that beautiful hymn that we pray all the time and we sing, Veni Creator Spiritus, come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, enlighten us, invigorate us, you know, make us creative disciples. We don't know how to, in which way to move, but the in, in discernment, in relying upon our community with one another, in that communion, in that discernment, in walking together, you know, in, I think that would open up new and creative ways of doing mission today. Like, like, look at this beautiful, as, as I see, almost 60 people are on the webinar here this evening. You know, wonderful response. So that's another creative way of going out. You know, uh, some of our institutions, the time has come where we have to, where we have realized that the mission and vision of our, some of our institutes can no more remain the same. Post-COVID world has changed everything. The pandemic has changed. And so it's time for us to revisit our mission and vision statements and mission and vision uh, of particular institute and change according to what the spirit is saying to us in the way forward. And I think that relying upon the Holy Spirit and creativity and in, in community discernment that will give us the way forward in the post-COVID world of doing mission. I hope I am answering your question, Justin, but more definitely you will have a wonderful occasion with Steve Bevins uh, on topic number four, as you can see that in the flyer on uh, 19th of August, it's on Saturday, faithful and creative discipleship in a wounded world. So Steve Bevins will deal with that topic more precisely. Uh, any questions that are coming up, uh, Nick? Yes, Albano, there's a question here from Tony Robertson. Do we know if contemporary mission theology is incorporated into seminary formation, adult faith education programs in Australian dioceses? I would say definitely we as SPDs, we take it very seriously. <laughs> Sometimes I'm a little bit disappointed. I don't know what is being, uh, yeah. I don't want to make direct comments attacking anyone, but uh, we as SPDs, I think, dramatic dialogue, you know. Uh, but but Albano, I think you'd have to say that YTU, yes. or University of Divinity, is one of the only places that has a specific missiological faculty exactly. that is not uh, present in the same, anywhere near the same way, in that's other seminaries. Correct. That's correct. That's that's correct. Nick, you have hit the nail on the head, I would say. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I I all the time I get this uh, emails and requests from other colleges within the university as well. And um, so yes, we need more people, uh, more 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 faculty members, especially with indigenous theologies, with contextual theologies. Yeah. Uh, and with mission studies, and um, also with the with the in Australia being very multicultural society. What about um, 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 I'm also also planning to even to design on a, a, um, a unit on interculturality. Mm -hmm. I think those are the very important uh, in the way forward that we need to seriously think about. Yeah. And, there's another question. Uh, if I understood you correctly, the document agentes refers to people who do not know Jesus as the recipients of the church's mission. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, if that is so, to what extent is the current mission of the SVD consistent with agentes' view of the church's mission aimed at people who do not yet know Jesus. How would you respond to that, uh, Nick? Uh, I would say we are doing both. I think we do have 
ministry uh, or mission ministry to people who do not yet know Jesus uh, or formation, adult formation, uh, biblical formation in a good way. Uh, also interfaith dialogue is, we have started it in Australia, um, but there are difficulties uh, at the moment having a person prepared and uh, trained for that. Uh, but it certainly is part of our charism to reach out to those areas. So to go beyond the confines of those who do not yet know Jesus. And Nostra Etate, I think, is a bigger scope. It's not only, it was mentioned specifically when the, some of the missionaries or people who were talking about missions said, well, forget about conversion. You know, we do not go overseas to convert the poor people out there. Um, I think the emphasis now is much more to do the missioning in your own home, in your own parish, in the way that we live, in the way that we share it. Um, and to, to develop that area. Yes, and just uh, um, just to add to that, to Nick, um, they are they are they are our mission partners today. You know, yeah. we don't uh, um, take, for example, the four characteristic dimensions that we as divine word missionaries we have is is mission animation, justice, peace, and integrity of creation, biblical apostolate. Yeah. And so they are our dialogue partners in parishes when people approach us. So again, inter, um, interculturality and also dialogue partners and uh, welcoming people of, uh, of different cultures and um, to begin the conversation itself. And hospitality is the important thing I see in our, most of our, um, of our SVD run parishes across in, in, in Australia. You know? Welcoming people and make them feel at home that they have a place on the table. You know? They have a place on the table. Uh, Robinson, you mentioned about Tim Norton. Yes, we are very proud and we are very, uh, Roger Schroeder will be joining Tim Norton in July. They'll be running uh, one week of a workshop on interculturality, especially with the, uh, the newly arrived priest in Australia in the Diocese of Brisbane. And uh, Roger Sh and uh, Steve Bevins is also uh, giving several talks also in the Diocese in Brisbane on uh, mission and synodality. So we are wonder very blessed to have these two wonderful SVD experts with us. Uh, and I'm sure we'll have these wonderful conversations. Thank you, Robinson. Uh, any other questions? Tien, are there any other? Interculturality is another topic. Yes, that will that is also coming up as part of the series, uh, which uh, Roger Shada will, will address. One of the things that you um, that you dealt with just briefly in your paper, Albano, was that from a sociological, anthropological point of view, a person works from their own human context uh, about their first efforts to go towards wisdom or to seek the journey of life, not to the church. Yes, exactly. So that that reminds us the importance of culture, the yeah. importance of the context, you know. Yeah. You don't go to your, your Bible or to the faith directly, but your own network of people, you know. And so that's, I think that's the start of, and so uh, as, a, as an SVD, I feel so proud that I belong to this wonderful, uh, anthropos tradition that we that we give so much importance to culture it's not just mission mm -hmm. mission faith and culture yeah. you know, how you, how vitally it is important in before we before we go to 
the different territory, we should know that the ground that we are approaching is holy. So we need to take our, our, our sandals off before we enter into a particular sacred culture. Yeah. And I think that is what we value as SVDs. And we have this, uh, we have, uh, other, don't get the names, but famous anthropologist as SVDs and the, and the famous magazine of Anthropos tradition in the SVDs. There's a question from Clement. Clement, would you like to express your, your directly? I can't yes. so Yes. Uh, I wanna thank you very much for your beautiful presentation. Uh, at the moment here in Australia, we're talking about the indigenous voice to parliament. Uh, so we as missionaries, how do we contribute to the conversation uh, in a spirit of prophetic dialogue? Is there a way we can go about it? Because the topic has become so divisive, like here in the church, and sometimes it's so hard to even mention it because you don't know who is going to attack you the next moment? Yes. So how do we go about it as missionaries? Yeah, Very good question, Clement, and a very sensitive one as well. But at the same time, I think in this current context, it is important for us, vitally important to be, to be well informed, first of all, ourselves as missionaries on the ground. You know? And people come for us to seeking advice in the parish context. And I'm, once you are on the, especially on the social media, you have to be so careful in what you are expressing mm -hmm. nowadays, you know? So I think the important thing is to get informed, first and foremost, as I have been listening so very often with Catholic social services and talks which are given freely by Father Frank Brennan, the books that have come out, you know, and to read. So he, he, he says he's about the, the three different types of communities that you will have who will, one who will directly say yes, are going to vote yes, some who have already decided to vote no, but that's the, the major section of the people who are on the line in the sense, or sitting on the fence and they need more information. And also, so our role as missionaries at the, at the, I like that beautiful theme of Pope Francis, fire on the heart, but feet on the ground. Fire in the heart with the Holy Spirit, but feet on the ground. Get well informed to read more about the national conversation that is happening in various levels and then inform our people accordingly. They will make the choice. But I, I think as our duty is to, is to give them the right information, especially in this COVID times and social media. I hope I have, un I have answered your question, Clement. Thanks, Abano. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, there are great resources which are available in Mexico. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Uh, I think we have. Uh, Ian, if we got some more advertisement to make, we are a little ahead of time, but I think we can wind down. I think it has been a wonderful evening of reflection of, uh, of so to say, seeds that have been planted in us, and then we will continue reflecting on this, and then there is a lot more conversation coming up in the days to come. And I think it's we will sit with those ideas to flower. Uh Alpha, yes, I would like to say that the documents that you have referred to, the Vatican II, and also the documents from uh, Pope Francis and so on, all of those documents are available in Google on internet. So if anybody wants to have another look at those uh, pertaining to the statements about mission and dialogue and so on, feel free to download and to work with the, the documents on the internet. Yeah, and just to, uh, once again, to remind, um, the lecture that I delivered today is only a part of the, um, the much wider project that I'm working currently on uh, what are the changes that have happened in the last more than 100 years in the discipline of missiology, how the understanding of 
aspect of the church has changed in as progressively in doing mission. That will be a much wider project that I'm working on. But at the same time, I'm, I'm so I'm glad that I was able to test some of the ideas that I presented this evening. And uh, thank you all for your wonderful review, your comments, your encouragement. And uh, yeah, that means a lot. Thank you all. I really appreciate your comments. No more questions uh, so far, Nick. And before you close the, the session tonight, I'd like to bring your attention to our next presentation, which will be on the 5th of July. At the same time, um, it's on Wednesday evening, the 5th of July. And the topic will be on prophetic dialogue and interculturality. Present, uh, will be presented by uh, Roger Schrader. So uh, everyone is welcome to join us next time. And Nick, uh, I think we don't have any more questions or comment. No. Uh, so could you close the session for tonight, Nick? Thank you. And thank you, Albano. And thank you, everyone. And thank you, Tian. And thank you, Albano. And thank you, all the people who were present and listening participating. It's encouraging. I would like to suggest that I would just say the prayer on my own because you cannot say it all together. Just listen uh, from one of my gurus from spirituality said at the end of the prayer session or at the end of the session, say the Our Father, say it slowly bringing everything together and offering it to the Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day a spirit of daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May God bless you all. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Abano. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night.